Your Excellency, Mr. Basile, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Banking and Finance Systems Panel. My name is Ronnie Aoun, and I will be very pleased to, uh, with my colleagues, the panelists here, to be able to moderate today's session. Uh, in the next hour or two, but we'll make it one hour, uh, we are going mostly to talk about investing, why and how to invest in a Lebanese fintech system. We, we want to provide you with a better understanding on the state of fintech in Lebanon compared to matured economies, highlight to you the opportunities for all stakeholders, and you will uh, learn about these stakeholders in a while, to collaborate in order to build a successful ecosystem in Lebanon, and particularly end our session with some recommendation of what our panelists think should be the immediate next initiative to uh, really improve partnership and leverage on the Lebanese diaspora to build up and take the uh, Lebanese fintech ecosystem to another level. The Lebanese banking sector has always been the cornerstone of the country's economy despite all crises. Lebanese banks have been expanding their foothold around the globe. Today, they are present in more than 30 regional and international cities over five continents. Banks have been enhancing their IT infrastructure to meet evolving business and consumer needs, and there is much more appetite to invest in technology. The emergence of numerous financial technology startups has disrupted the financial world as we know it. These companies are nimble and typically focus on building the best solution for one narrow problem to improve customer experience. These fintechs have exploded since the 2008 financial crisis due to a combination of cheap capital, unmotivated or out-of-work finance professionals, and advances in cloud computing and machine learning. Investment in this sector has reached $25 billion in 2016. This digital revolution is changing the way we traditionally interact with banks for investment, loans, money transfers, and other transactions. A couple of years ago, Bill Gates noted that we need banking, but we don't need banks anymore. Perhaps not yet. So technology is indeed reinventing finance, and big banks are increasingly turning to startups to help them navigate the change. Lebanon is a fertile environment for young and emerging fintech businesses for so many reasons that you already know. High level of education, great talent pool, solid financial sector, and last but not least, the diaspora global reach. Lebanon can become a fintech magnet in MENA region and beyond, and Lebanon's financial institutions are eager to play an active role in this undertaking. We know Circular 331 of the Central Bank, which has increased to a certain extent the number of investors, incubators, and accelerators, but maybe not enough to create or retain talents in Lebanon. We can learn from developed economies and institutions who, are, who have moved fast in this transformation. Desjardins Group, which is, representative today, uh, which is uh, represented today by Shadi Habib, is the largest cooperative financial institution in Canada with close to 50,000 employees, and it is a very good example. One, uh, Chadi is behind several strategies, and he will talk about it, an innovative solution that is helping Desjardins embrace the fintech phenomena. But as you will learn in the next few minutes, establishing a fintech ecosystem requires the collaboration among government, financial institution, entrepreneur, and investors. And we are privileged to have in our panel Fadia Asali, who is the chairman of Sidrus Invest Bank in investment banking, Carl uh, Wazen, the chief business officer at Yoko, a card payment and point of sale provider based in South Africa, Wahid Shamas, who is the uh, founder and CIO of Tiregate, a private equity firm. Gabi Andari, who is the CIO at Bank of Beirut, and last but not least, Najib Sher, who is the Executive Director, Head of Banking, 
department at Banque du Liban BDL. So we will seek their point of view on how Lebanon can embrace the fintech phenomena faster, build an effective and sustainable fintech ecosystem, and become a, very, a regional player in fintech. So let's first start by understanding, and for people who are not very familiar with the word of fintech, is financial technology, but you will learn more and more about it while people are talking about it. But we want to start with Fadi, who will uh, give us an overview of where the Lebanese fintech system stands today. And later we'll uh, hear about what's happening in other parts of the world. Fadi. The knowledge economy is becoming uh, an important factor in the, in the growth of the, of the Lebanese economy. And it's meant to play a much growing role in that, in that uh, perspective. Let's start by describing the, the landscape of uh, the, fintech, the fintech sector in Lebanon. Uh, who are the major players, uh, current players and uh, potential uh, players? Obviously, banks, uh, commercial banks and investment banks uh, play a, an important role in that area because they provide financing. Financing not necessarily through traditional ways, i.e. lending, but banks are allowed to, to invest directly or to provide mezzanine financing. And the 331, as you mentioned, Roni, opened the door for banks to play a much growing role in the, in the financing of, of the sector. Uh, the government is, is another important player because the government should lay the ground for a, a modern infrastructure, because without a modern infrastructure, we cannot have, a, obviously, a fintech sector, a successful fintech sector. It starts by cheap and efficient internet. Uh, it goes up to encouraging the legal system, uh, enhancing the legal si system in that direction. We still don't have a, an e-signature law, for example, in Lebanon. So all that needs to happen to happen quickly in order for us to be able to develop the sector further. The VC firms are uh, an important and uh, necessary player in that area. Their number has been increasing substantially in the, in the Lebanese uh, uh, fintech sector. And they cover different, different phases, A, B uh, phases, etc. Incubators and accelerators also which are uh, intended to educate startups in important areas like finance and the, 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 the op how to operate their businesses efficiently. They are playing a greater role in the overall ecosystem. Central Bank of Lebanon has uh, been a major uh, player and uh, initiator of, of uh, the growth of the sector through CC1, which is, which is a very visionary circular and innovative one allowing banks to participate through equity financing in these uh, startups. Universities are another players, and they should be encouraged to, plow, to play uh, an even greater role uh, in educating the, the youth uh, in technology areas. So these are the major players that should, some of them are doing their roles, some of them they should be playing a bigger role like the, the, the government, like universities, etc. Uh, Shadi, if you move to you, Shadi, can you share with us uh, what, what, is, what does it take to build up a very solid and most important sustainable fintech ecosystems and what kind of collaborations is needed really to grow into this because we know there are several stakeholders in this process that are involved in uh, participating in this kind of undertaking. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. By the way, I'm extremely happy for the invitation. Thank you. I'm happy to be back in uh, Beirut. Uh, I like to use pictures to talk, so and I'll also make it less boring, I hope. I hope we'll get you engaged that way. I only have about 50 pages. Is that okay, Ronnie? And then we should be done around 3 we, p.m. We negotiated the third. Just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> Uh, Ronnie already talked about Desjardins, so I won't spend time. The reason I like to always tell people about Desjardins, what, what it is, just you, you get a feeling for it. It's a cooperative, it's a mutual. 
our job, uh, our shareholders are our 7 million members and customers. It's a model where you are focused on adding value to the members. But let's talk about uh, fintech. Before we talk about fintech, uh, I'd like to just spend a little bit of time defining what fintech is. Why is this such an exciting time around fintech? Why are we talking about fintech? Fintech has nothing to do with financial technology. It has to do with consumers having very different expectations of financial institutions than they had 30 years ago. At least in North America, consumers no longer accept to consume financial services and insurance the way they used to. We used to push it to them as an industry. And we think FinTech is related to young people. Actually, baby boomers are as relevant in terms of FinTech as the young people. And from my brief stay in, in, in Beirut in the last couple of days here, I, I, I would argue that the impact is the same locally here in the region. So I'm gonna now just give three messages. My first message is gonna be to investors and FinTech startups. My second message is gonna be to financial institutions. And my third message is gonna be to governments. And then we'll, we'll talk briefly about the case study and I'll give it back to Ronnie. He told me to finish in seven minutes, so I will do that. My first message is to startups and to investors. We see too often everybody is excited now about starting a business to the point where we have graduates from universities that don't even look at a career. All they want to do is take advantage of funding to start a business with an exit strategy. That's fantastic, that's exciting, but I would encourage everybody to make sure that we're working on ideas that add value to the consumer and to society. Exiting without adding value does not bring any value to anybody. And it's just a small reminder because too often we see projects and ideas that are there simply for a short-term short -term objective. So that's the number one. And by the way, the most successful fintechs are focused on the guys behind us here, the consumer, and how they're gonna consume those services. My second message is to big banks and financial institutions. I met a couple of them in the last couple of days. Uh, I work at a large financial institution. People tell me that uh, fintechs and startups sometimes, are they competitors? Are they taking away your lunch? We do not believe there's any competition between fintechs and banks in the short term. In the medium term, it's a great opportunity to work together. Startups have ideas, they can move quickly. And for the bankers in the room, let's be honest, banks have the customers, but don't move quickly. It's a great marriage between the two. Desjardins has had fintechs in their commercial offering for the last five years, by the way. For the last five years, we already embedded fintechs in our offering. So there's no competition in the short term. What will happen, though, if large financial organizations don't take advantage of this trend and partner, I think in the medium term, they will take their lunch away from the large organizations. Sorry. My message to... Uh, to government and leaders and educational organizations is the following. The, the classical economic models of businesses and competition because of FinTech and our digital world are changing. There's a concept of co-opetition. Talent is gonna become a big issue. I'll talk about that briefly. We're gonna talk about that later as well. And what I encourage uh, our leaders is to think outside the box. Instead of everybody rowing very hard in different directions, can we work together a little bit harder in the short term to create traction before trying to overly compete too early in the process? Uh, in our case study, what we did in the Jardin the last four years is we opened up the ecosystem and invited even our competitors, our competitive bank, can come and participate, what you see on the screen behind you, is an annual event where we invite everybody to come and brainstorm and innovate, whether it's a startup, whether it's education, whether it's a government organization, on how to change our own industry and how to take business away from us, how to disrupt our own business. And we invite even competitors. By the way, I'm happy to host you in September. If you like, you can join us at the center of the city where we, uh, where we do this event. I'm gonna close off with my favorite image uh, I'm going to be just negative for a second. I'm a technology guy. There are 12 technology things, I'm not going to go into them, that are changing our world. They're changing the world here as well, by the way. And this is going to cause a lot of issues, whether it's employment for youth, ethics, confidentiality, security. You hear all this in the news. I think, I think I'm optimistic, however. 
I think it's very important that everybody in business, in government, in education understand those technology levers so that we can build resilient systems. A plane like you see on the screen, the wing can move 19 meters without breaking and, and the airplane will stabilize. I'm optimistic that if different parties work together, we'll be able to go through this stage where I do think we'll have some negative impact on our society and our Importantly, our young talent, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. No, great. Thanks, Thank you. Shadi. Um, what, what we heard so far is really a two perspectives, one from Lebanon, one from North America, but also coming both from uh, the banks. So investment banking, investment bank, and a large uh, cooperative financial institution. Uh, if, if you can bring back the ecosystem built up by Desjardins, the slides, because I think most of our discussions will go around this, and this is the core of what needs to be done even here in Lebanon. And in my opinion, it has been a very innovative approach by Desjardins, which was led by Shadi, which is creating this ecosystem and bringing whether they are competitors and different stakeholders into this lab. And I have always been impressed by what was created a couple of years, I think two, three years, three years. ago uh, in Montreal at Desjardins. And the reason why I want to bring it because all our conversation will be about different stakeholders in the process and what's the importance of each one of them to get into this kind of ecosystem. And I will start by a fintech startup uh, with Carl. Carl has decided in his uh, fintech, and he will explain to us why and how, he put his fintech in South Africa. And uh, Carl, can you go ahead? Tell us about uh, you know, your card payment uh, startup and maybe later why you decided it is South Africa and not Lebanon? Um, sure. Hi. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Carl Wazen. Um, I'm the co-founder and chief business officer of uh, Yoko, which is, um, as Ronnie said, a card payment solution for SMEs based in uh, South Africa. Um, I've been away uh, from Lebanon since 2005. I was raised here. Um, following uh, my departure from Lebanon, I spent uh, seven years in Dubai as an investment banker um, and a private equity investor and management consultant. Um, I decided um, after spending several years in the corporate world um, that my calling was more suited to early stage businesses uh, where I felt like I could make more of a difference. So I decided to move to um, South Africa, to Cape Town especially, uh, a city that I fell in love with when I first visited. And um, f to me, Africa was the next frontier when it came to uh, technology, when it came to uh, investment. And uh, Cape Town was a uh, very suitable place to base myself from, to take advantage of that uh, Pan-African opportunity. Um, so in 2012, myself and three South African friends of mine started, a, um, uh, started Yoko. Um, Yoko is a classic fintech case. Um, we basically target SMEs who were previously underserved by the traditional banks. Um, and in most markets in the world, um, you'll find that SMEs get a very uh, limited range of uh, support. Uh, from traditional financial institutions because um, they're fragmented, they're small, etc. So when we set up Yoko, the idea was to um, offer a very low-cost way for SMEs to accept card payments, but also a way that um, provided an equal, if not better, level of customer experience. So that's why we basically got set up. And uh, since we launched in 2015, we managed to um, uh, grow our base to eight and a half thousand merchants, um, adding about a thousand every month now. I'm very proud to say that 70% um, of those uh, SMEs um, that we work with had never accepted card before, uh, which goes back to, um, I think, one of the main pillars of FinTech, which is about expanding access of financial services to the previously underserved segments. Um, uh, it's not about um, taking a piece of the pie, it's about making the pie bigger, and that's what makes it exciting for entrepreneurs uh, to get into uh, fintech. Um, we've had to partner with one of the uh, South African banks, uh, which is, um, as mentioned previously, a key part of uh, the fintech ecosystem and, and uh, a necessary 
uh, partnership uh, in order to deliver fintech um, uh, successfully. Um, our partnership uh, was very successful, so we were able to work with a bank that gave us the license to operate, but at the same time uh, gave us quite a bit of autonomy um, so that we can you know, really design the uh, organization and experience that we wanted um, in order to succeed, and that's, that's worked out very well. Um, so I suppose uh, to go to your point um, with regards to um, uh, Lebanon, now that I've given you the um, the, I mean, the, I talked to Freddy, he was willing to uh, invest in your company, yeah. right, Freddy? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. but if you come to yeah. Lebanon. Sure. Uh, yeah, so maybe to touch on the investment part, I think, uh, um, you know, one thing that has worked for, for us is, uh, so we, we, were, um, we were able to raise a substantial amount of VC um, based in Cape Town, but not from South African investors. So I think on the investment side, uh, I think focusing only on local investors is overrated. Right, we're a very global, uh, connected, um, uh, uh, you know, world right now, and you can actually reach out to investors that are all over the world to find investment for your company. Obviously, you need some proximity, right? But you can find a good combination. Um, but specifically, our Yoko is, is is focused on Africa at the moment. Um, you know, we, we we see a tremendous opportunity in West and East Africa. Um, and, and obviously South Africa, we're still just at the beginning. Um, MENA would be our phase two, uh, phase three actually, right? And, and, and I personally would love for us to base ourselves out of Lebanon, right? Targeting, targeting uh, MENA. Uh, maybe that leads us to the point that you, um, the, the next part of the question, which is, you know, why not Lebanon? Um, and, you know, context did not really allow for me to set it up here, right? I, as I mentioned, I never actually worked here. My career was all based overseas, and, and I was taken uh, down a certain path. But you know, if I were to look uh, f from an entrepreneur's perspective, um, um, you know, so I think the whether fintech or, or other, I think the entrepreneur is, is a very key part of this um, of this ecosystem. And you know, I think entrepreneurs um, are, are optimists by nature. So, but you need to nurture that optimism by providing an environment that is enabling. Right, so, and, and enabling from a bottom-up entrepreneurship point of view. So you want multiple entrepreneurs to be comfortable to start their own companies without you know, feeling that there are any barriers for them to actually succeed. Um, and those, very briefly, I'm speaking of uh, you know, quality of life, ease of doing business, you know, bureaucracy, traffic, infrastructure, all these things right, that make it really hard for anyone to, um, you know, to operate at the, at the full potential. Uh, that they can. So these are obviously things that don't help Lebanon's case as a fintech hub. Um, but at the same time, you have all the other fantastic, uh, uh, you know, the banking sector that's very powerful. Um, you have the education. You have the people who actually um, are based here already. And that, that brings me to my point. I think the best thing that we can do today is not think who can we bring into Lebanon um, to build companies. You need to first build local success stories. So you need to take the guys that are already in the market and you need to support them and create an environment where they can actually succeed. Because once they succeed, even if it's on small things, that's when you'll be able to you know, really have a case to go to entrepreneurs who you know, have opportunities everywhere in the world, right? To actually choose Lebanon instead of Dubai for MENA or instead of uh, you know, anywhere else, right? So um, it's, it's, I think, uh, as, a, as a mission and commitment in the short term, uh, you know, I would say to the different stakeholders to you know, look at the guys who are already started, like these guys are taking the risk, you know, and support them and, and, and allow them to build out their vision. Okay. Um, I, I know it wasn't part of the storyboard and my question, but I have a question for you because I know that the core of the ecosystem is really the partnership and collaboration between yep. uh, your kind of your companies and others. So I, I would like to, to know what's your, your point of view and how do you think collaboration with large banks is, uh, is feasible? Sure. In, uh, in a fintech like So yours. I think it's very feasible. Um, I think that what you need is a bank to have a fintech strategy. It doesn't matter what that strategy is. I think banks cannot ignore fintech, obviously. We've heard this multiple times, and, and, and I think Shadi's uh, real-life example is, is, is you know, very inspiring. Um, and uh, you know, also, as, as, as Fadi was saying, I mean, this is, uh, is happening today, right? We have... Uh, banks acting as investors, as partners. I think what a bank needs to have as a strategy, if, it, if it's just being opportunistic about fintech, 
right? It's not going to it's not going to win in the end. So as a strategy, I mean, you can either be very open the way Desjardins is, so open up, you know, have your APIs exposed. Everyone can actually plug into you, even your competitors. I mean, that's really inspiring stuff. And, and we obviously prefer this model because um, as a startup, we benefit the most. You can also have a walled garden where you're very vertically integrated, right? Where you basically either partner deeply with companies by investing in them or having, you know, more long-term exclusivity agreements or the like, but at least be consistent, right? And with the startup um, so that, you know, startups can actually know, um, you know, how to deal with you as a bank. Uh, but banks have a critical role. Um, and, you know, in the long term, maybe that role will diminish a little bit, but there are things that banks will do that fintechs will never do, right? So focus on those and open up the rest. Okay, thanks. Uh, I want to move because this is obviously uh, the core of, of uh, developing a fintech uh, and talk about the, uh, the uh, importance and the issues around talent. This is my, my preferred uh, topic is, uh, you know, how can we attract the right people, how we can develop them, how we can retain them in Lebanon, whether there is any value in, in bringing people from outside Lebanon. In any market I go usually, it's always the question of talent retentions come up. And um, I want to start, I, I, I know that uh, several one of you have strong opinions about that, but I want to start with, with Wahid and uh, listen to Wahid, what, you know, how he sees this challenge around talent important in building up this kind of fintech uh, ecosystem. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to tackle the question in three ways, okay? First, and I'll be very, very brief. First, uh, to give you my real life example, I've never lived in Lebanon. But it's always been a dream. I mean, uh, nothing can beat the lifestyle here. And so if you could actually develop a business that uh, doesn't change much, it's very globally oriented, but you can actually couple that with a lifestyle here, that's very powerful. And um, um, I just uh, uh, finished working um, at uh, Janus Capital. That's a $400 billion fund uh, based out of the U.S. I spent 11 years there. Before that, I was at Goldman. And the reason I'm giving this story is uh, I built a team, and some of them were Lebanese. And we just broke off and um, um, uh, created Tiergate Capital. Um, and um, a portion of the team, there's some people in London, but a portion of the team are Lebanese folks, and they all wanted to come back. And so three of the Lebanese employees are now based in Lebanon. And uh, two weeks ago, we funded um, a very large SME lending platform in India. And I give this example because that talent emanated from Lebanon, and money came out of here into India. So it's funny to hear the story of, you know, um, 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 in South Africa, you were funded there and you were not funded here. So that's the first thing about talent is, you know, I believe, yes, there are infrastructure issues, etc. But um, where there's a uh, will, there's a way. Uh, Lebanon does provide a lot uh, for folks to come back. Now, a lot of what we do is global, not Lebanese. So that gets me to my second point of talent. So Circular 331. Uh, what a fantastic, fantastic initiative, okay? Uh, but it gets to 99%, I think, of the way, all right? First is the backing of the central bank, very powerful, uh, the will. Um, uh, I think we have the second highest amount of VC money now per capita, which is astonishing globally. Uh, but then, you know, I'm, I was invited to be part of the board of, um, um, uh, of a 331 fund. Uh, I play an advisory role. Uh, but my point is, why not go for the full, you know, for the full cake? Why wouldn't these great initiatives open up to Lebanese globally and say, you know, if, you're, if your business is global and you're earning revenues or making investments globally, uh, come here, don't just get a P.O. box, that shouldn't be allowed, but set up in Lebanon, hire the great talent from the universities, which I can tell you are phenomenal, phenomenal. And, um, and, and then don't worry about your revenue pie, it can come globally. Right now, we're battling quite a bit of bureaucracy and a lot of rules associated with what is the right business to fund in Lebanon. Should it be just Lebanese with Lebanese revenues? We should get rid of that mindset and really think about bringing Lebanese here to employ people here and think outwardly. And then last but not least, um, a message to the banks. You know, I hear time and time again, you know, resistance uh, in terms of fintech, um, uh, Ronnie. Number one is half the fintechs today cater to banks, they're B2B. So, the, so there's a very big misnomer that fintechs are just out to destroy business models. It's just not true. The other issue is, and this might be different in Lebanon, but 
Two-thirds of income today in global banking doesn't come from the traditional loans and assets, okay? It comes from fees, credit cards, services, uh, payment solutions. And when you think about that, that's a 25% ROE business. The traditional banking is, is like a 6% ROE now. So I can tell you banks need technology and fintech to act like consumers to be able to cater to this hugely growing profitable business. And um, um, uh, yeah, those are, you know, those are my remarks. Okay. Um, let me, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, I want also to, uh, to go further in the talent component of uh, what we're uh, doing when we build up an ecosystem. It's really talent is not about male, but talent is about male, men, and women. And um, in terms of financial technology or, or fintech, and even finance, we have always seen that it was more male dominant. We, I know that in, uh, in Canada, we're working very hard to encourage more and more people in this sector, particularly in the technology aspect of finance. And I, I want to hear from you, Wahid, briefly, but I want to get the opinion of other people on the panel here about the importance of getting war, more women uh, into the workforce interested in the uh, financial technology in general. Yeah, I mean, um, so th that question, um, I can answer it, was a little bit foreign to me because I work with so many women. I'm, you know, we have a very, very strong focus, and this is not just in my current job, but in my previous one. We looked at boards, and we went after companies to improve themselves. The women makeup of boards was really, really important because, not just because we wanted the quotas up and to, to get a checklist. They provide a different kind of rationality, a very different kind of analysis. They had a very different viewpoint about human capital within companies and how to nurture that, et cetera. So um, uh, for, for better or worse, evolution says men can be huge risk takers, okay? And we are, you know, we jump the gun quite quickly and want, want you know, results and deals. And women tend to be very, very thoughtful, and I'm not trying to generalize here, but very thoughtful, weigh balances, look at risks differently. So from a financial institution point of view, when it thinks about risk mitigation, um, thinking broadly about how to get human talent to work for a fintech or a bank traditionally. Um, it's not just a quota, Ronnie. Women play a very, very integral role. Um, okay. And women work in my organization. I tend to give them the, the, um, the, the, the kind of work that's related to making an investment decision, believe it or not, because they have a different kind of weighing risk and reward. And, um, and, and, and when, they're, you know, when a deal needs to happen, then, then I'll send in the men sometimes. So, okay. uh, so I, I feel like I know how to work with both of them. <laughs> uh, Gabby, I would like to, to hear from you, Gabby, if Bank of Beirut, what you're doing to have uh, more women in technology inside a bank like Bank of Beirut. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, That's not can try the other one. <clears throat> Looks like that's the mass I can reach. Okay, that's better. Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, go back to the point to kind of women in, in technology. Obviously, um, we don't want to have men coding our entire future in technology and fintech, right? Uh, we need to really to encourage women. Um, the diversity is uh, imbalanced quite large in this part of the world, uh, and usually in the male-dominated countries. But I will go back to the point that we have great universities, and uh, the top 10 universities are in high, ranking high in math and science. I think there's a great opportunity for women to really kind of get into the FinTech, the technology area, be entrepreneurs, um, to close the gender gap. Um, the way, the future, that's where we're going into that direction. However, in Lebanon, especially for Bank of Beirut, um, my entire management staff, 50% um, woman, 50% male. Uh, total staff, 30% woman, and we want to uh, increase it to 50% and encourage it. We have, as you know, there's a brain drain, talent brain drain from the country, and predominantly male-oriented. So I believe there's a huge opportunity for women to set up some kind of consortium, women tech uh, institute, 
like Mobile Monday in Canada, for example. So I think we need to encourage it. We can do a better job of encouraging women into getting into technology. Um, and uh, clearly, the regulators that can help, central bank can help, institutions like universities can help into that. And mentor, we, we lack of mentoring and, and encouraging women into, into that field. Great, thanks. Shadi, I know we always uh, talk about it in, in Canada, whether in FinTech or other, is really to bring more women into the workplace and man at, at the management, the senior management level. But I want to, to know exactly what Desjardins is doing. I know there have been so many initiatives around educating uh, women and getting their interest into this field. Can you share this with us, please? Mike again? Oh, thank you. If you don't mind, before I get to the women, I'm just going to come back to the talent globally because I, I think this is a very big, big question. I'll give you an example. Today you can buy a software for $30,000 a year that can take away eight jobs. That's today. Message to the education system and the industry. I hope what we're educating in the education system are the talents need to create that software and not the talents that eventually will be replaced by that software. This is, I think, a very, very important part. And so what we've been... Thank you. Yeah, yeah. What, we've, what we've been doing for a while now in terms of talent, and I'll get to the women question in a second because it's a very important question, is uh, you have to get out there. The industry has to get out there. The government has to get out there. The universities have to take this very, very seriously. The talents of today is not what we're going to need in the next three, four, five years. What we're pushing out in terms of curriculums, very good stuff there, but not necessarily always the most relevant of what we're going to need in the future. Uh, today, by the way, for the last five years with three major universities in Montreal, we co-build cybersecurity, cybersecurity curriculums. We co-build big data and analytics curriculums. I don't want to just throw jargon out there. But these are things where industry and the education system have to work together. You cannot just wait till it happens on its own. I think it's very important to bring it together. Now on the subject of women. On the subject of women, I am actually a, very much a, a capitalist in this point. I'll explain what I mean. In Canada, we're going to have a shortage of 300,000 technology professionals in the next three years. 300,000 technology professionals. Obviously, our universities do not produce 300,000 technology professionals. The good news is that only 15 to 20 percent of women decide to go into technology. That's not, you tell me, why is that good news? It's because if I can, if we can convince more women to go into technology, we can then help close that gap. And by the way, I personally think the skills, the natural instincts, I think you mentioned it a little bit, of women are much more appropriate for what we're going to need in the coming years in terms of technology. Nothing to take away anything from men, by the way. So we have several programs. It's not just at the university. We have programs now with primary schools and secondary schools. Earlier today, I was speaking to a woman, and I said, why didn't you go into technology? And she said, that's for geeks. That's for geeks. That's for people who want to just play with code. My answer to her was, if you want to work on a subject that's going to change our world, and I do think digital revolution is changing health, financials, government, then this is a pretty exciting field to be in. That's my pitch. So the target, I think, is not just universities, it's not just curriculums. You've got to start at the primary and secondary levels and deal with all the peer pressures that are happening. And these are the various programs that we've put in place to help facilitate that. We'll see the results in five, six, seven years, but we're working on that since a couple of years now. Great. And Enjoy. just to make sure we're walking the talk, 50% of my staff is women, so we're walking the talk, by the way. Thank you. There's one yeah. woman clapping over there. For me. <laughs> Thanks, Shadi. So let's move to uh, uh, Bon Guiliban and Circular 331. Uh, we talk a lot about it. I, uh, we, we would like to, to understand to which extent uh, Circular 331 promote investment in fintech. I know that there is nothing uh, clearly mentioned in Circular 331, but uh, how you position as a Bank BDL the 331 with respect to investment in, in fintech? Okay. Uh, uh, الحقيقة ليش وصلنا ل 331؟ هو قبل ما وصلنا ل 331 ب 93 بعد الحرب الأهلية أول ما جينا على البنك المركزي 
كان قطاع المالي والاقتصادي بحالة يرثى لها يعني بتذكر كان حجم القطاع المصرفي كله ما بيتعدى 10 مليار دولار التسليفات للقطاع الخاص كان 3 مليار دولار موزعين على 32 ألف مقترض فقط ونسبة الديون المشكوك بتحصيلها يعني الـ NPL كانت 25% انطلقنا منه أربع ركائز بالحقيقة أول ركيزة الإنونية عدلنا التعاميم كلها لحتى نصير up to date مع العالم يعني نسبة الملاءة الـ Consumer Protection Corporate Governance الـ E-Banking etc تاني ركيزة ثبتنا سعر الصرف لنمنع التضخم لنعطي ثقة بالعملة ولا نزيد احتياطيات مصر في لبنان اللي هلا صاروا فوق ال 40 مليار. تالي ركيزه واساسيه هي البنيه التحتيه الفاينانشال انفراستراكشر. اشتغلنا على البيمنت سيستم، اشتغلنا على الكريدت ريبورتنج، كريدت ريجستري، مركزيه المخاطر، مركزيه الشكات. واشتغلنا على الجارانتي سكيم كفالات يلي بتضمن المؤسسات المتوسطه والصغيره. مش بس هول، رابع ركيزه واللي هي كثير اساسيه هي التحفيزات، بلشنا أول شيء بإعفاءات من الاحتياطي، الاحتياطي عندنا عالي بين 15 و25. كانت وقتها بهذيك الأيام ما في ولا قرض متوسط طويل الأجل، وكانت القروض كلياتها بضمانات عقارية. بقى شجعنا البنوك اللي بتعطي قروض متوسطة وطويلة الأجل إنه هالقروض بتنعفى من الاحتياطي الإلزامي، وبس استعملوا احتياطي صرنا نعطي قروض مباشرة بفايدة كثير قليلة 1%. والدولة كانت عم تدعم القطاعات الإنتاجية يعني زراعة، صناعة، سياحة، معلوماتية بعدين لقينا أنه في نيش كتير كبيرة بعدنا ما خدمناها اللي هن ستارت أب ومن هون طلعت فكرة 331 خاصة أنه اليوم من بعد هالتحفيزات اليوم نحن حجم القطاع المصرفي المصارف اللبنانية بس 206 مليار دولار إذا بتضيف عليهم الوحدات بالخارج اللي هن 38 مليار صرنا 244 مليار يعني أكثر من أربع مرات الناتج المحلي الودايع 175 مليار دولار التسليفات 58 مليار دولار وأنا بمركزية المخاطر يعني الكريدت ريجستري عاطي مليون و300 ألف اسم يعني بس الأكتف هلأ 930 ألف مقترض ما كان في ب 93 ولا قرض شخصي ولا قرض سكني، اليوم عندنا فوق ال 120 ألف قرض سكني. بس مع هيدا الكل التحسن اللي عملناه الشمول المالي يعني الفاينانشال انكلوجن يعني نسبة الأدلتس اللي عندهم حسابات بالقطاع المالي الرسمي ما بتتعدى 50%، وهون دور الفنتك. اليوم أنا بعطي إكزامبل صغير، أنا من ضيعة بعيدة 32 كيلومتر عن بيروت بجبل لبنان، من بعبدات لبحمدون في أربعة فروعة أنا بس بدي أطلع حاسب الشغيل اللي عندي بدي أخذ كاش لأنه إذا بدي يروح يقبض تشيك راح نهاره الموظف الهون الموبايل بيمنت والفنتك هون دورهم لتقدر توصل هالخدمات المالية لكل بقع البلد بدون أي كلفة ميزتها الموبايل بانكينج أو الإي بانكينج إنها سريعة رخيصة وبتوصل لكل حدا عندنا بلبنان فوق 80% البنتريشن للموبايل. الفكرة هي كثير عيني انه هالخدمات المالية توصلها من خلال الهاتف، أصلا اليوم أكبر منافس للبنك مش البنوك بين بعضهم، هن أبل وجوجل وأبل باي وفيسبوك ماسنجر، اليوم عم بيخدموا عم بيقدموا خدمات مالية، اليوم نحن مضطرين كقطاع مالي ومصرفي انه نواكب هالتطور وإلا هل المؤسسات الكبيره طبعا مش الفنتك الصغيره عم نحكي او المؤسسات الكبيره يلي عندها بعتقد على السوشيال ميديا في 3 مليار ونص او 4 مليار الشباب يمكن اخبر مني بالخبريه وعندهم زباين ما بتخلص ما في واحد الا ما عنده حساب على السوشيال ميديا وقادرين يخدمون وقادرين يخدمون واليوم بلشوا الخدمات بس طبعا مش كل الخدمات بقى ضروري نحن كثير بحاجه للفنتك ونحن صراحة غير قصة إنه الفنتك وال والخمسين بالمية من الشريحة اللي ما عم تنخدم إنه بنقدر نخدمها إذا في عملنا أبليكيشن سهلة وتكون سكيور أهم شيء تكون سكيور سكيورتي هو إشي كتير مهم بالنسبة لنا بس ما فينا كقطاع مالي ومصرفي يعني مصرف لنا ومصارف لوحده ما فينا يعملوها 
بدك الموبايل اوبريتور يتعاونوا معنا، بدك كمان الدولة تتعاون معنا وبدك قوانين لترعاها، يعني التوقيع الالكتروني صار يمكن 15 سنة عم بيدرسوه بعد لهلا ما خلص. آه لنشجع المايكرو وسمول وميديوم انتربرايزز اشتغلنا على السكيور ترانزاكشن لو، يعني نخلق آه آلية لرهن الموجودات المنقولة للأشخاص اللي ما عندهم آه عقارات ليقدموها كضمانة، وبتعرف المصارف في لبنان متحفظه شوي عاده بتطلب ضمانات حتى مع كفالات عم بيطلبوا ضمانه اضافيه اليوم القانون صار له خمس سنين خالص وبعد ما حدا حركه نحن كمصارف ومصرف لبنان عملنا واجباتنا المفروض الدوله تساعدنا لنقدر نكمل هالواجب سوري نجيب وقتها بتقول نحن وهن يعني هن مين؟ يعني الدوله بالقوانين ما بطلع القطاع المصرفي ولا مصرف okay. لبنان يعني مثلا طلعنا اخيرا من دوينج بزنس هو تقرير بتطلعوا بطلعوا البنك الدولي بقارن بين البلدين سهوله انك تفتح شركه وانك تاخذ رخصه كهرباء ورخصه عمار وتاخذ كريدت وبعدين بيحكوا على الانسولفنسي والى اخره البانكربسي عم نجرب نحسن قانون الافلاس عملنا مشروع قانون تسوية خارج المحاكم ما قدرنا مرقناه طلعنا تعميم 135 إعادة جدول للديون خارج المحاكم اللي عم نقدر نعمله نحن مصر في لبنان وقطاع مصرفي ومالي عم نسوي بس في القوانين لازم تلحقها القوانين التأخير عم بيكون بالقوانين وما فيك تعمل فول موبايل ابلكيشن بدون ما يكون في وين تحكي يعني اذا صار في خلاف وين بيروحوا فادي اتس نوت بارت اوف ذا سيناريو بس اي وود لايك تو هاف يور كومنتس اوف وات وير هيرينج فروم بي دي ال كان يو واتس يور رياكشن تو اول ذيس اتس توتالي ترو ان اولد تو بي ايبل تو ديفلوب فور اكزامبل ديجيتاليزيشن ات ذا ليفل اوف بانكينج اتس فيري امبورتنت تو بي ايبل تو ديفلوب ذا لوز بيهايند ذات e-signature and other th things. Otherwise, we cannot go forward, move forward, because the, the operational risk, the legal risk would be too high for us to be able to execute transactions openly on digital platforms. So that, that's very, very important. Being able to develop laws is, is uh, a major step in developing digitalizations, uh, digi digitalizing services at the level of, of the banking sector and developing the whole fintech sector, basically. Shadi, I know we're not perfect in Canada with this, and I know we're still working on uh, legislation. I know we're behind in Lebanon, but uh, what's your thought on where we stand in terms of regulating all this sector in, in Canada? So my, uh, I would say two things. First of all, I do think that traditional financial institutions sometimes use regulation as an excuse not to be agile and fast and transform their own organization. We, uh, we, we we think our biggest challenge is our own internal culture. And it's normal, it's not a judgment. For the last, in our case, 115 years, we've been working one way, and now the consumer is telling us, no, we'd like you to work to a different way to our advantage. So in, in one aspect, we, we do think that. On the other side, what's interesting, what's happening, in, at least in Canada, is uh, there are tables, there are uh, meetings between the industry. So there are, uh, we sit on a, on, a, on, a, on a committee with the regulators and there are fintechs, like the example of Yoko, at the table as well. We all sit together and say, how does regulation have to work in such a way that it evolves not to the advantage of the big banks, by the way, not to the advantage of the fintechs either, but to the advantage of the consumer and their ability to either have the, bank, the unbanked becoming more banked, uh, lower cost per unit for their services, simpler services, and so on. I think the number one challenge is, is uh, dialogue and having a discussion. I do think that the transition has to be managed, and I don't want to give any specific examples, but when you have a digital transformation or a player come into an industry and it's not well managed with a regulator, ultimately it's actually to the disadvantage of the citizens and the consumers. So I do think there's an important role regulators have to play. And I close on the last topic. It is very hard for us as an industry to stay up to date with all the evolutions. It's very hard for the fintechs to stay up to date with all the changes in technology and their impact on our society. Imagine how hard it is for the regulators to stay up to date. And I do think that's why all three 
have to dialogue to, together to figure out how, how to move that forward. They have to talk together. Great, thanks. So um, I want to uh, uh, not really conclude, but I want to get to a point now where, uh, as we have representative of all stakeholders from an ecosystem except probably the government, who is not represented here, but I want as a final note that each one of you, whether you're a banker, you're a startup, you are BDL uh, uh, or a, um, a venture capital, to give us, because I want to leave the audience with something practical. From your point of view, what are one or two things that we, can, we should start doing tomorrow to be able to improve this ecosystem and create more collaboration, attract more talent into this uh, space? Uh, what would you recommend? And please, not more than two. We as banks, we should uh, start to think you know, in a non-traditional way. So uh, banks have been using CC1 mainly to invest through funds. So we should be able now to start to uh, think about direct investments. And this maybe could be uh, more the role of investment banks than of uh, commercial banks. But it's very important that we uh, have the capability to be able to you know, assess the opportunity itself, not through funds, be able to participate in shaping the strategy uh, and, and raising the right uh, uh, finances for the company. Uh, uh, so that's very important and it will help the sector uh, develop faster. Uh, Carl, from a startup perspective or a fintech company perspective. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of um, supporting entrepreneurs, um, right, there's, there's a great deal that can be done still. Right? So, um, as I mentioned, there's, there's, there's the basics, um, and, and, and it's, uh, government's not here, but uh, I think that, uh, that, that that's very important uh, to create that enabling environment. Um, but then also to do, create, and this is more, maybe more a general ecosystem thing, but I think it's, if you want to create leaders out of these entrepreneurs so that they can also attract the next level of talent themselves, right, because you always need to have the right people leading the companies. Um, I think since this is a diaspora conference, right, it's, it's to capitalize on, on, on this network that we have of Lebanese entrepreneurs and investors um, and, uh, you know, maybe formalize it a little bit more so that entrepreneurs here uh, can learn from their counterparts in other markets. So, for example, like I would love to spend, or I'd love it if a Lebanese entrepreneur told me he wants to spend a week with us at, at, in South Africa with my company, for example, and we would basically work hand-in-hand hand, um, on some of the challenges that they're facing here that we've maybe solved before, um, and, and vice versa. Um, so it's, it's about like really helping them solve the problems that they've, that they've already done, um, uh, and, and uh, we could use the diaspora for that. Great. Uh, Gabby, a large Lebanese bank, what you, what you thought? Well, I think there's a lot of opportunities to really magnify the, the technology and the efficiency in Lebanon and most of the banks they're looking into offering digital experience and we're pushing that envelope into certain certain limitation until the regulations get flexible and we can have the data more shared and more open between institutions. Two, uh, as back of Beirut and for the for for encouraging the diasporas and all that. We just launched this weekend a platform called Lebanon Investors, which is to connect the diaspora uh, kind of uh, uh, folks with local and established uh, uh, accelerators, investment, local talent as well. So to put it all together and, and the bank will facilitate all all the legality part of it to make sure that it's done. So this is one of the thing. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to move that needle. FinTech is here to stay. And we need to do a better job on, on really kind of getting into that level. Especially right. most of the banks now, they start to have international footprints. And you need to raise the bar. That's, that's a given. Great, thanks. Najib, Bank du Liban. أول شيء بحاجة لإنترنت. أول شيء هيدي يعني بده يكون في عندك إنترنت وإنترنت سريع يعني مش الموجود اليوم يعني 
اليوم برات بيروت الانترنت في مشكلة كبيرة هاي أول شغلة تاني شغلة financial education عندنا مشكلة بالفاينانشال ادوكيشن يعني اليوم كلياتهم هون انا مأكد انه عندهم كريدت كارد، ما حدا بيعرف قديش بيدفع عليها، ولا حدا بيعرف شو حقوقه وشو واجباته، مع انه نحن مطلعين تعميمات ال 124 وال 134، 124 حددنا الاي بي ال انوال برسنتج ريت يلي كل بنوك مجبور يحطوها، وال 134 يلي حددنا حقوق وواجبات وحطينا دي بي ار ديت بيردن ريشيو والى اخره. في عندك قبل ما تروح على الفنتك تبلش تعمل عملياتك المالية على التليفون أو بالكمبيوتر بدك تعرف شو حقوقك وشو واجباتك عندنا مشكلة بالفاينانشال إدوكيشن لازم نهتم فيها وشغلة أساسية أنا برجع للبيزك نحن بلبنان ما عندنا يونيك نمبر يعني أنا اليوم بيجي لعندي مثلا واحد بيقول لي هديك النهار ما نقول لح أعطي اسم هيك جورج خوري مثلا تعرف كم جورج خوري فيه كيف بدك تفرق جورج خوري عن 2000 جورج خوري موجودين بالكريدت ريجستري عندي، ما عنده يونيك نمبر، بدك ترجع لاسم البي واسم الام وعائله الام وتاريخ الولاده، يعني في اشياء اساسيه بيزكس، اليونيك نمبر ما عندنا. اليوم لتتعامل مع برا مضطر يكون عندك جلوبال ليجل انتي ايدنتيفاير، هلا عم عم بيشتغلوها، مفروض كل شركه يكون عندها رقم موحد. اليوم السجل التجاري كارثي. وهلا عملنا مشروع الشباك الموحد للسجل التجاري وعندنا ابلكيشن موحده ورقم موحد وبعضه ناطر بالصف لا يمرق القانون لنقدر من مكتب المحامي بتتسجل الشركه بالسجل التجاري بتروح نسخه الكترونيه على وزاره الاقتصاد على وزاره الماليه على الضمان الاجتماعي على البنك المركزي يعني هالامور اذا ما عملتها ما فيك ترجع تروح على الالكترونيات ما بدك تبلش بالبيزكس ما البيزكس ما قعد معنا اياهم اوكي ثانكس وشي انا ما بحب كثير اسمع البيزك هيدول لانه بدي بس البوزيتيف بس مضبوطين هيدول هيدا الواقع وان شاء الله ان شاء الله بنشوفه عم يتحسن وشي وات دو يو ثينك اوف وات ار يور ريكومنديشن كابل اوف وان سو اي لوك I've been at the conference for two days and I've heard a lot of great speeches and everybody talking about let's get the diaspora more involved and invest there and invest here and you know I think it's staring at us in the eye. Um, uh, there's nothing more irritating than for me to go to Palo Alto in LA, which I did two weeks ago, and meet this young Lebanese guy that figured out a technology that allowed all of you to watch a movie and take it any direction that you want and there's like eight different outcomes for the movie. And I said, okay, the talent, can you hire them in Lebanon? And the answer is yes. He actually loves it because he loves the talent in Lebanon, the creative aspect of it, etc. And it's just so annoying that I fund this guy. And then I have to go introduce him to all the different uh, institutions in the UK and um, in Silicon Valley. When, you know, here are Lebanese that can come set up here, they have their idea, get transfer knowledge to Lebanese locally, employ people, boost the economy, and then tap Circular 331 money, make the funds here money, as opposed to half the money of Circular 331 being yet to be deployed because there are not enough opportunities in Lebanon. It's so frustrating, Ronnie. So it's staring us in the eye. You've got great ideas, great facilities in the central bank. Open them up to Lebanese. I'm not saying somebody from another country, right? To Lebanese, they've got to set up in Lebanon, they've got to hire Lebanon, and they can export globally. Okay, let's stop. You know, we're almost there. We just need to be little, we need to think a little bit bigger, and a lot can be done. Okay, like it. Thanks. Thank you, Wish. Shadi. By the way, I completely agreed with uh, what Wahid just said. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Lebanon can lead and not suffer the digital revolution. And there are many ingredients, but it, Ronnie said you have to mention one. I would mention one, and I'll give you the example that we faced about eight, nine years ago in uh, Montreal. Eight, nine years ago in Montreal, everybody wanted to do something with FinTech. Every university, every bank, every insurer, uh, even regulators. And everybody started working really, really hard. There's only a small problem. Imagine the visual. Everybody's rowing very hard, but they're all rowing in different directions. And if I was to maybe suggest one ingredient is figure out at the beginning how circular, this circular 331 is not a distraction that forces everybody to start running in different directions, but actually focuses your energies, at least in the short term, 
until there's enough traction, because let, let's face it, we're, we, there's not a huge critical mass here. We're not talking about the collections around Palo Alto and San Fran or some of the other centers like London. You gotta get the traction going up front, and I would say the number one ingredient would be to start by leading together, crossing boundaries that maybe we haven't crossed in the past. I don't know if this is the case, but competitors will have to work together. Different education organizations will have to work together. Different investor groups will have to work together. Instead of everybody trying to do it on their own, would be by far, by far, what would be my suggestion. And I suspect it's one of our weaknesses as Lebanese, but I'm optimistic we can overcome it. Great, thanks so much. So, thank you. Uh, so what, what, what we heard is uh, at least I would say seven to eight recommendations, which uh, I know th there is a lot of work around these recommendations. It's uh, to get to the level that I think Lebanon deserves in the financial sector in terms of fintech ecosystem. Uh, it's a journey, but uh, we can make it happen. We can make it happen. I think the two core messages that come up in all the discussions is the importance of collaborations. We need to collaborate. It's not just that we, we want and it's nice to have. It's important to be able to collaborate and to have all stakeholders participating in building up this ecosystem. And the importance of tapping on our talent. We have great talent. This is a talent that we need to nurture. Uh, there are several ideas that have been talked about which is really improving our curriculum from early stage to get more and more uh, men and women interested in, uh, in this field. And uh, I am confident that we, uh, Lebanon, can, can become a model for uh, fintech ecosystem. I want just to, uh, I know our time is over. I thank, thank you very much for all of you to have participated to, to that. Uh, but I would like to take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, anything that you would like to raise to any of the panelists? Yes, please. Uh, do, we, do we have any, any micro or something to, for the... Would you like to come up and, and raise your question? Yeah. And by the way, thank you for taking the lead in asking thank questions. You. Good morning. Uh, from what I understood is that the Circle 331 uh, gives an incentive to the banks to, to, to invest up to 4% from their, from their assets, uh, liquid assets, into the IT uh, startups. Now, uh, this is where the kick is. Up to 4%, so it might be zero. There is no obligation to the banks to invest 4% of their assets into the IT startups. So this, it gives it back to the banks to choose and decide if they want to invest in this or not. So this up to 4% is this is where the, the, the confusion and the misconception is. The central bank has to come very clear on this. Is it up to 4% or is it 4%? Thank you. Thanks. Who, who's uh, <laughs> who's the best to answer? <laughs> I think Fadi. That's can he can Fadi. answer. You want to leave? In fact, it's uh, three percent of the equity of the bank, not of the assets. But anyway, uh, central bank cannot oblige banks to to invest. Otherwise, it will have to to be responsible for the whole investment, right? <laughs> so banks have to have the choice to invest or not to invest. It will all depend on the opportunity at hand. But I do agree that banks need to be more active and, as I said, in, in making direct investment and being able to assess the opportunity. But they have to have the choice, after all, to invest or not to invest. <laughs> In fact, one of the challenges that the, the, the fintech sector is facing is that there is too many funds chasing too few deals, basically. Because, because they're all local. That's why. Make it global for Lebanese. The idea is to create so, jobs in Lebanon. Yeah, I, uh, I hope we have more, I wish we had more time. And uh, if you are invited next year, we can do part two and we'll see how we evolve. Uh, again, thank you very much.
uh, for being here, attending our panel, and if there are any more questions, we are going to be around. Right? I am done, or? There's a, well, only there's a question sorry, because there. I, sorry? Oh, there's a question. There's, there's one question. question. I, I got one more question. Uh, there's Go a question ahead. Over yeah, sorry for that, because I got no, no question. All right. So one more question. Hello. Okay, I'll, I'll make this a quick question. So we are a Circular 331 funded early stage pre-accelerator program in Lebanon. I work with a small company called Alt City, and we work with a lot of the universities and, and other groups in the ecosystem, but we're also working very actively to turn what we perceive of as challenges in the country into opportunities. So many of the challenges that we see and talk about of energy and water and health, traffic, etc., are not unique to Lebanon. Even internet um, a slow internet is, is far from unique to Lebanon. These are global problems. And if we change our framework, we can actually perceive of them as opportunities. And so as part of that, we're actually launching a global first, which is an, a, an accelerator program, a for-profit funded accelerator program in collaboration with UNICEF that looks at the LCRP, the Lebanon Crisis Response Plan, and maps it out to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN, to see how those could be actually great business opportunities. And I wanted to bring it up in the last session with the Chambers of Commerce, but it's just as relevant with you folks on stage, is how can we think of every opportunity, every syndicate, every Chamber of Commerce of uh, Lebanon around the world as an innovation hub, as a pre-accelerator, as an accelerator to help build the knowledge economy. Since the knowledge economy is growing in multiples faster than most every other sector um, of the traditional economy, here in Lebanon, we're relying heavily on traditional sectors and largely um, underappreciating the knowledge economy. So could we think of every place, every bank, every syndicate, every chamber as a hub for innovation? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think these are fruitful thoughts. Very good comment. Thanks. Uh, one more and yeah. we're done. Uh, but, but we're here around if you want later to ask uh, questions. I, I just have a quick and straight to the point question. Um, and it's mainly for Mr. Sh'er. Um, where do you think we're heading in terms of blockchain technologies, cryptocurrencies, and Bitcoin in particular? Especially that uh, Banque du Liban recently uh, warned individuals and businesses from uh, handling and using uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we, see, we have seen uh, the state of New York passing the law of uh, bit license, I think it's called, f uh, to actually uh, legalize and uh, to uh, contain uh, the movement from fiat currencies to cryptocurrencies. Where, where do we stand on this and uh, how do you see this developing? You mean Bitcoins? Bitcoins, yes. it's, Bitcoins it's and cryptocurrencies in uh, general. By law, by law, you cannot uh, deal with. But Bitcoin who passes these laws, and on which research is this based? Uh, because we we don't know what's Bitcoin. The biggest, and what's the, the guarantee for the Bitcoin? It the could biggest be in your computer or in the cloud, and you can lose it any time. So something. I mean, so we're not allowing it because of lack of education uh, from the government on this front. Am I mistaken? Uh, it's, uh, we, uh, we can. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if you, thank you. Anyway, thank you for raising I'm, the point. I'm really sorry to hear that. Yeah, that it's a the concern. Lack of education of the government is really <coughs> keeping us, uh, is holding us back. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. But it's well noted. Thank you. Thank you very much.